Uh, I come from the University of Salamanca, as I as was just said, and I come specifically from the Department of Translation and Interpreting. So what I'm going to be talking to you about is translation or uh, academic writing into English by non-native speakers of the English language. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, summarize very briefly a study which I conducted and presented. Uh, I'm going to talk about a new related to that material, and then at the end of the of the session, I'm going to do uh, a very short um, case study of one of these abstracts that I'm talking about. It, in uh, this study is based. It, it's sort of a part two of a presentation which I did in team 2013 where I studied a corpus of 197 um, abstracts which had been uh, translated or written in English directly uh, accompanying articles that were written in, in languages other than, uh, than English. Languages typically you know, predominantly Spanish but also Catalan, Gallego, uh, Portuguese, Italian, French, and other, and other articles. So uh, the study is of those abstracts in English which were comprised by uh, authors whose native language was supposedly not English. I discovered in that study that 73 of, this, uh, 73 of those abstracts contained some sort of uh, error, um, either a grammatical, vocabulary, or typographical error. Um, in, uh, there, were, uh, there were 16 of those abstracts which contained at least three errors of more than one type. Okay? So this study is a study of, how, of those 16 um, abstracts and the writers of those abstracts and uh, the ultimate goal is to try to come, to come up with an answer for how these abstracts could have, uh, could have been produced. I'd like to stress that because this uh, team conference is about um, uh, basically electronic communication and, and so on, uh, all of the uh, translation studies journals that, that these abstracts were published in are electronically available either only on the internet or on the internet plus in paper format. So the, the, uh, the material that was studied was uh, open access electronic translation studies journals. Uh, so I just said, we're, we're going to try to explore uh, reasons for why, how this could have happened. Um, the hypothesis behind this study is basically that something in either the writing process or the editors and authors' attitudes will uh, provide an explanation for the, the high error instance of these 16 abstracts. Okay, so basically I'm going to try to very, very quickly go through the methodology. The authors were contacted, uh, the 16 authors were contacted and they were asked uh, three different questions about um, the process of publishing the, those abstracts and that was based on a, an article by, let's see, there, the laser pointer works, uh, by Perales Escudero and Swales where they basically asked uh, the authors the questions that are on the board. Plus, these authors were provided with a sample uh, of their writing, uh, you know, uh, in the Swales, uh, in the Escudero uh, and Swales article, they were provided with a sample of their uh, of their abstracts, and in my case, I provided them with a sample of an erroneous uh, usage of of English, and asked them to comment and reflect on it. Um, as far as the editors go, uh, the editors were asked um, three qu three items about how the abstracts in languages which are non-English, Spanish, Catalan, and Gallego especially, how those abstracts were compiled and, and revised. Uh, then they were asked the same questions about the English abstracts in order to determine whether a part of the process was different and could supposedly lead to uh, error instances. So these are uh, the questions uh, which were posed to the, to the journal editors. Um, the second part of the survey uh, also asked those editors about their experiences and attitudes related to publication of abstracts in English. And there were basically four different questions. Okay, the first question was whether they agreed that English language provided visibility and prestige to their publications. The second question was um, whether they could pose uh, 
an explanation for the differences in quality among the abstracts in English language or in uh, Spanish translation studies journals. Uh, the second one was to uh, for them to express their opinion about the wide differences in the style guidelines for authors that were noted in my study uh, presented at, at Team 2013. And finally, they were asked whether they agreed or disagreed with the fact that the uh, author's style guidelines should contain more detailed uh, specifications, okay? So let's look at uh, the results, okay? Um, results, uh, I received uh, of the 16 authors that I wrote to uh, asking for their cooperation, remember these are the 16 articles which, uh, abstracts which contained at least three instances of different types of error, I received six responses. So that, you know, that response rate was a 37.5%, which was actually quite similar to um, the rate of response that um, Perales, Escudero, and Swales obtained from, from theirs. So we can extract some conclusions based on, based on those responses. Okay, basically um, what, was, what was found, uh, and I'd like to just ask you to look at the highlighted portions of the text above. Uh, most of the article, most of the authors wrote their, uh, wrote their English abstract in the same language as the, te uh, as the text of their articles, and they either uh, translated those or wrote those without revision, Okay, neither by a native speaker nor by a non-native speaker. And in two cases, uh, the authors had uh, resorted to uh, colleagues of theirs who had a greater knowledge of English, but in neither case were they, not, were they native speakers of, of the English language. Um, I'd just like to point out that none of the authors contacted used uh, professional uh, translation in, uh, or revision in any, rega any regard. Okay, and I think that's, that's quite important. Okay, um, I just would like to point out a few things that emerged uh, from, the, from the responses. Um, I believe that most of the authors seem, you know, most of the authors of these 16 abstracts that, were f that had frequent errors were, they stated how alone they were in the process of writing and translating. And there are just a few, just two examples on, on the board of their responses. Uh, the first person writes, I wrote it directly by myself. And, you know, it was yo sola uh, in, in Spanish. All the answers, you know, all of the examples of, from the uh, surveys are, were translated by me for the purposes of this, uh, of this presentation. And here's another example. You know, I wrote the abstract in Spanish. No one helped me translate it. And it was, uh, you know, nadie me ayudo was the, the terminology they used in Spanish. Okay, um, just... Another, another key point that emerged from the author's responses was the fact that um, many of the authors either didn't know or assumed that someone at the journal, typically the journal editor, would revise their abstracts, okay? And there are just a few, uh, have a, let's have a look at the second quote just to get a sample of, the, of an answer of this type. In principle, the abstract was revised by the editor of the journal and by the coordinator of the specific issue which obviously in this case never took place because this is one of the authors whose abstract contained at least three uh, errors of different types. Um, let's just, uh, this is sort of a mini discussion about uh, the conclusions of the author's uh, responses to those, uh, to those questionnaires. And basically it, it comes down to the fact that the authors uh, wrote these texts by themselves, they did not use professional revision, and what should have happened afterwards in the editor, in the, in the journal edition and uh, copywriting, uh, uh, copy editing phase never, never took place. Okay, so let's look at the editor's responses. Um, the editor's responses, uh, there are 10 translation studies journals that were, you know, the methodology is described in the team 2013 presentation, which was published later in 2014. Uh, there are 10 journals that were, that were studied. So those 10 journals were, the editors of those 10 journals were sent uh, a survey by, via SurveyMonkey, uh, which maintained anonymity, and those editors uh, responded to, uh, to a number of questions to the questions that we saw already in the, in the methodology. Six responses were received, 
One was incomplete, so it hasn't been taken into account for the purposes of this, uh, of this study. So we've got a 60% uh, response rate, which I think is, uh, again, a basis from which we can draw some very interesting uh, conclusions. Okay, basically uh, what, what I found out is that the edit, you know, mainly the, the burden of revision fell mainly upon the editors. When they described their internal processes, the editors were almost always the person who was, you know, holding the fort, let's say, in, in, terms, of, in terms of quality. Okay, none of the journal editors, I think this is important, okay, none of the journal editors uh, mentioned that any of their abstracts um, were either revised or translated with help from the publisher. In other words, the publisher, whether it's, um, you know, University of Granada or, a prof or you know, an independent company publisher, none of those companies provided any support in, the, in terms of revision or translation of English language abstracts. Uh, and then there's just um, a, one, other, one other comment by one of the editors mentioned that occasionally, uh, though not systematically, blind peer reviewers would often alert them to problems concerning the English language abstracts. Okay, so as far as procedures go, uh, two conclusions emerged from the, the answers of the six editors. Um, they often describe the process of revision of English language abstracts as a collective effort on the part of the board of directors, uh, sorry, the editorial board, and uh, you know, the non-English and the English revision processes were the same in half of those instances. So by, you know, by, we can conclude that in the other half of the instances, there was some difference between the process of revising um, the texts in languages such as Spanish, Catalan, Gallego, etc., and the revision process of the English language. So there we might find a little, let's say, a gap or a, a, a slippage in, in terms of uh, quality guarantee. Um, the, the editors were asked the question, what happens when there's an incorrect or an absent abstract? What happens? Okay? And this, this, these conclusions, I think, are quite, quite interesting. Um, in about half of the cases, uh, let, let me just uh, go down to the second one. Half of the journals themselves, remember, without the help of the publishing house, provide the missing abstracts or correct the missing abstracts. So they're doing this in-house. Okay, again, I'd say with very little support. Remember, alone, yo sola, nadie me ayudó, no one helped me. And this seems to repeat itself in the, from, the, from the role of the, the, the journal editors. Uh, there is one, one journal which um, uses exclusively professional translation. So I would just like to point that out. It emerged as a, as a unique case among the six editors who responded. That journal uh, does not require authors to submit an English language abstract accompanying their articles in languages other than English. It asks them to supply uh, an abstract in Spanish and then has, that, has those abstracts professionally translated. Okay? So this was the testimony of that one editor of that journal, okay? And the reasons she stated was simply they had had so many bad experiences and it was so costly, I mean costly in terms of time, not necessarily money, uh, that they uh, decided to resort to that solution, okay? Um, I think I'll just, uh, this, this is another conclusion that emerged from the editor study. It seems as if the, as if the journals are going to great lengths in order to, uh, in order to help the authors, in order to avoid ha uh, resending uh, the poor abstracts back to the authors and mm, sort of Im impinging upon them to do, uh, to do more work related to their articles. So they're trying to tackle these things in-house again. And here are some of the testimonies that just, uh, that just attest to that. Let, look at the... Mm, you look at the first one. It just says, an alternative is author, offered to the author whenever this is possible, and if major changes are considered necessary, the author is contacted in order to, order to approve these changes. 
I mean, the, the journal is taking upon itself to do uh, much of the work that might have been done by the author if the article had been sent to, had been sent to them for correction. Uh, these things are taking place within, within the journals themselves. Uh, so let's, uh, I, I think I'll kind of, the, the next four slides are about um, the editor's um, attitudes and experiences. Uh, five out of the six editors agreed that English was a language that would provide additional visibility and prestige. Uh, the one sort of dissenting author partly dissented by saying that she believed that, or he or she had mm, believed that, uh, because the, editor, the editor's uh, survey via SurveyMonkey was anonymous. Uh, so that author believed that, um, uh, that other languages were also viable internationally and could provide uh, similar uh, prestige. Um, about whether there should be common style guidelines, there was a clear dissension between uh, you know, between approximately half of the authors who believe, half of the editors who believed that their, um, that all journals in translation studies should have common guidelines and, and I think this is particularly, oops, sorry, particularly interesting, uh, that three of the six editors favored allowing differences to remain, okay? Uh, so this is, uh, these are just a few samples of, a few samples of those responses that were, that were that were received. Um, let's uh, in favor whether they were in favor of more detailed guidelines or fewer details in the guidelines. Uh, again, uh, th they were basically heavily in favor of there being uh, more broader freedom for for authors. So I think this leaves kind of a gap where. Uh, you know, where, where error instance could, could occur. Um, as far as the last question was, uh, how could you explain the differences? Um, please note that a number, of author, a number of the journal editors, and this is sort of uh, three cases of the journal editors, uh, attribute this to author, lack of author competence in uh, the, the abstracts that they receive. Uh, and then the other three, um, the other three editors denoted that this perhaps is due to the, to the fact that the journals themselves, and they seem to recognize this, do not provide the revision that they should, uh, that they should provide. I'm going to conclude now. Um, uh, if you would like to have a look at um, the case study, it's a sample of, um, it's a sample of uh, you know, of an abstract containing errors and then, a cr and then correct, you know, a proposed correction of that abstract, I can provide that to you in the, perhaps in the discussion if there's extra time at the end of the session, okay? So thank you very much for, uh, for listening. I think what we've, what we've seen is just basically a, a sort of patch of blind territory where authors providing, um, providing less than correct abstracts can Pub can have those abstracts published in journals that do not guarantee via their procedures and the people involved and so on. So there's, you know, there's an area there wh which, is, which is uncovered. So thank you very much for, for listening.